We can do this better. It's a crisis. It is a national crisis, what we're dealing with, with domestic abuse and violence. And we've got to be better. We've got to be more vigilant. We've got to be more proactive. And we have got to be more competent. Like, stop this. Stop this. And it's just because lives, that's it, lives. And it's, it's, it's children's lives. That's what it comes down to. And it's like... Real life stories to bring awareness to domestic violence, human trafficking, and systemic corruption. Welcome to our podcasts and lives. We are so happy that you joined us and hope that you like and follow us and would love for you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Let the show begin. So you're, you're on <laughs> There you go. There you go. So Kristen, it is so nice to have you back on the show. And it's nice to see your beautiful face again. How have you been? I've been good. I've been good. Just doing doing this life as a survivor. I'm trying to navigate through everything and, you know, taking it one day at a time, one step at a time. Just, I mean, and I'll get into that with what I want to talk about tonight, but you still feel like you're walking on eggshells most days. And, and one thing we talked about the last time was you never know when you're going to have to go through something or deal with something or what's coming next. So you're constantly living in a world like this null and void in a sense, like you don't want to make any big moves because you're not sure what the court's going to do. You don't want to do anything too sudden because, oh, is it going to be used against you or is it not going to be used against you? It's you're walking on eggshells with whatever you do and whoever you're with and and even whatever you talk about. So it's like you're you're constantly under a microscope. And so it's 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 something. It's something. But I'm apparently doing a good job so far. But well, sometimes it's one moment <laughs> at a time. Yeah, one moment yeah. at a time. Yes. And that PTSD really does a number and the yeah. anxiety and the paranoia and it's all legitimate that mm-hmm. we have retaliation from the system, from the courts, mm-hmm. from in, in your case, you have the police department that you have to be concerned about. And that's a lot of factors that for any person is going to be horrifying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I'll introduce myself again. I'm Kristen. I am a survivor of domestic abuse and violence. So, and childhood trauma. And so I come from a backstory of 15 years of management, business experience, also just a bachelor's in science, general studies, studying exercise physiology, healthcare management. In the past few years, I've narrowed down with domestic abuse and violence education. I did a stewardess for children, darkness into light. I'm currently currently working with doing a class with a police department to overcome some of my trauma and to reiterate that not all police officers are bad. There are still some good out there. So I'm doing a civilians class to not only work through some of my trauma, but to also gain some insight because I do want to be an advocate for domestic abuse and violence. I want to work with victims and children. And so I want some insight on how it works on the other end when the good guys are working cases or the good guys are doing the right thing. And every few months I do self-defense courses, whether it's jujitsu or through like some of the police departments do offer free classes for the communities. And, and just to keep myself current and up to date and what's going on, because those things do change over the, even in a matter of a year with domestic abuse and violence and how we're supposed to protect ourselves, but also it's just very empowering. So that's just my little spiel of who I am and and why I come here today. (laughs) And yeah, and so that's actually when you bring up the PTSD, it kind of is a part of what I want to talk about tonight, but there's So one thing that the Louisiana, I'm here in Louisiana, and so I like to talk about not only parts of my story that I can talk about and examples of that, but some of the challenges that Louisiana faces and some of the things Louisiana really kind of needs to get their crap back together on. Um, I have, with all the advocacy work that I do, the, the vast majority of people that have come to me for help are from Louisiana. So I don't know what the hell they got going on down there, but it ain't good. 
Well, well, one of the main things that is a huge concern is, is what well, we have Napoleon law are the Napoleon laws, Napoleonic code. So I need to look at more into that. At one time I really did. So that's a huge struggle within our court system period overall. And no other states reflect that or have that. We're still very, Louisiana is still a very, even with trying to be progressive and having things move forward. We're still so far behind in where we should be. I know at one point I was told that over that my assets and everything, I was like, regardless of anything, like we were together more than seven years. So even by common law marriage, I get half of everything. And and someone straight up looked at me and was like, no, that, that doesn't exist. That doesn't exist anymore. And I'm just like, that's a bunch of bullshit. So yeah. So, but anyways, basically when you go into a court of law here in Louisiana and you're in family law uh, court, automatically the judges are kind of, it's, it's a thing that the parents should just get 50, 50, the parents should just get 50, 50. So it's just something that's really hard to fight against. And that's not okay. Especially in cases like this of domestic abuse and violence. And like I was, I had to be in a situation where after I attempted to escape and seek safety with my children and I be back in a situation where our abuser had a lot of access to us. And so that's when 75% of victims are killed. Usually it's more dangerous and that's not okay. So it's, it's, it's very dangerous. It does a lot of damage. And, Absolutely. and there's been a lot of studies that have been done as well that are very much reflective of children being killed because of this automatic 50-50 custody. So a lot of people don't realize that if there is a perpetrator that's an abusive partner, in cases of that, over 60% of those abusers end up abusing the children if they aren't already. And that is a huge number. And Nobody's going to take care of that kid and, and look after that child like a safe mm-hmm. parent is going to. And if that safe parent isn't there to help keep them safe, that's about as exactly. dangerous as you can get. Exactly. Now, I cannot say specifics, but I know in my case, that happened to us where our abuser, our abuser was doing things that definitely harm the children or could harm the children. And even in an attempt to possibly harm or unalive, my life could have unalived or harmed the children. So absolutely for sure. And then in the instance where, in my case, where there was a a part where at one point the judge gave our abuser full custody and I was basically removed out of the situation completely, he was not a responsible person. So there was a ton of neglect and abuse going on behind those doors. And I was the safe parent the whole time crying out for help. We need protection. Like I'm trying to get away from this because it's not good. It's not okay. But, you know, I was just looked at as a crazy person or a mental health case instead of though I had evidence. And as I brought forth what I could bring forth last time, though I had evidence and tried my best, I was completely just like most women, which is something I'm going to bring up because it's something I wanted to piggyback from last time, just basically put in a box like, oh, this is just a crazy person. She needs to be locked up. She needs to be over-medicated. And we're just going to label her as a, uh, let's psychotherapy treatment her for the rest of her life, pretty much. She's and, just a crazy lady. You can't believe a lick of anything she says. Right, exactly. And that's one of the things like I was looking at, because I'm like, man, I really wanted to talk about this last time was like, I went over the rape numbers because I went through, I went through horrific stuff in my life. Like I went through, and I'll talk about this. I wanted to talk about this one specifically maybe another time, but I had a horrific incident in college that I went through. And then not only the sexual abuse and and sexual assault experienced with my abuser, my main abuser in my life. So there were multiple instances of this horrific trauma. And we talked about, I brought out the statistics that like less than 1% of those who are the perpetrators are actually incarcerated. But if we just look at that 100 number, 75% of those victims, and we can look at this for like domestic abuse and violence survivors, as well as rape survivors, any trauma survivors, 75% have social problems, 55% have physical ailments, 50% have substance abuse problems, 50% have PTSD. And I'm going to say 
that number can probably be higher because like myself and other women, we're very much misdiagnosed many times Absolutely. because we're, mis- we're misdiagnosed with multiple other mental health issues because PTSD is actually the main, but there's umbrellas of different things going on. Well, there's a um, lot of victims as well that don't seek treatment and yeah. or don't even realize that that's what they're experiencing. Exactly. Yeah. 30% contemplated. 30% have this goes. That's why I say the PTSD could be higher is they, they separated this one for this, this quote, 30% have anxiety, depression, 15% attempted, which I would also not be surprised that that number is higher. And then 60% experience other forms of distress. And that's one thing I wanted to talk about is like, making the connection to like how domestic abuse and violence is not a personal problem. It's a community problem. It's like, oh, there's like a ripple effect. It doesn't just affect me and my kid. It affects everybody. Like it affects us as a whole. And that's why I believe in bringing more awareness and education to the the people. Because like in the last time I talked about the estimated cost that it, it exceeds like the 8.8 billion because at times jobs are a problem, keeping jobs, finding jobs, holding jobs. But, and then too, like I was the root causes to different issues like homelessness, substance abuse, violent behaviors, or the continuation of domestic abuse and violence, PTSD or mental health issues. The root causes, when you look at them, are domestic abuse and violence. So it's like, if we can really get it together and look at, all right, what can we do in this one area? Look at all of the other areas that we can help and we can start to really hopefully do better in. So yeah, so that is what I really kind of wanted to talk about is how it affects it really does affect everybody. It's not just a one person problem or it's not just the, oh, the victim's problem and, and this going on or the court and this. It's, it's, a, it's a community involvement and it, and it affects so much because I know I've struggled with jobs from not only being with my abuser and my abuser doing stuff because I didn't even know at the time, like you said, uh, women are abuse victims because it can be women or men. Abuse victims don't know what they're going through at the time, but not being able to keep jobs or not being able to get the job you really want or do certain jobs because they manipulate you or they do different things because they don't really want you to succeed in that way because that takes power away from them. If you're even allowed to work. Exactly. I, wasn't allowed, I wasn't even allowed to leave that. I couldn't go to the grocery store without him being there. And the few times I was allowed to go anywhere on my own, it was limited. I was timed. I was questioned. Like that just wasn't an option. And I finally, when I knew that I needed to start getting something for myself to be able to leave, I started, that was what brought me into web design. And I started doing that thinking, oh, this will be great. I'll be able to stash some money away. He won't even know. Oh no, not how that played out at all. I was only allowed to take the jobs that he wanted me to take. And it was a nightmare. He'd scream and argue and shut the internet off and refuse to pay the bills. So they very much dictate everything. Everything you do, everything you do. Oh, I know. I know. I mean, I, I could go grocery shopping, but like I would have to produce the receipt every time. And if he didn't see the receipt and be able to look at like every single thing and like question, what is this? What is this? What is this? It was like, it was like the end of the world. It's interesting. Like when I look back on it now to like different things that would happen over the course of our time together in that relationship of like how I can see he would do things like, cause I was always, I was always blamed, right? Like I was always blamed whether I was like locked up for something or that whether it was a job, like, cause people in my family would be like, you can't even keep a job. And it's like, no, I can actually, I can keep a job. It's like, I've struggled with severe abuse and severe PTSD, which is a disability. I'm like, but I'm actually a very good employee, a very ethical employee and a very competent employee. I just have some things that happen because of circumstances beyond my control in my life that suck. But people in my family who don't understand what I've been through and don't have education on domestic abuse and violence and PTSD, 
And then of course, like from coming from my abuser, it's just my fault. It's my problem. And I do it to myself and I'm the one to blame. So it's so hard because you can internalize so much of that and you can sit on that, but it's hard because society does that as well to you. Society does it as well to you. Because they don't understand. Society definitely needs to have more awareness and yeah. need to learn some, at least pretend, you know, <laughs> compassion. You know, yeah. At least pretend yeah. sometimes. And sometimes if you don't have something nice to say, then just shut up and walk right? away. Exactly. Because, like to go through the trauma that we go through as a survivor and then to have society put you down and victim shame you and victim blame you. It makes you feel like you're this small. You get the beat out of you, made to feel like you're a worthless piece of shit. And then society turns around and says, here, let me kick you while you're down a little bit more. Y'all need to stop. It needs to stop. It needs to stop. Cause it's just, it's, it's too much. We already struggle with our worthiness. Like we don't need additives on there. And it's just, it's a lot like, and, and I'll go into this because it's a part of like one of the things I realized and discovered is I get attacked all the time. So when I met my abuser, this is a big thing that I struggle with because it's easy for certain family members who it's their problem that they deal with, but they project it onto me. But, and this is totally off of what I wanted to speak about, but we're here. So let's roll with the flow because it's real talk. So whatever. <laughs> we're winging it. And if anything, we can edit it, whatever. But so for example, like, any time in my life, if I have spoken up or gone against the grain, spoken up against toxicity or been like, hey, what we're doing in our family, this isn't okay. Like, this is not good. Like, we need to do something different. We need to, like, I was the one that was always put into therapy. I was the one that was always like, oh, send her to the doctor. She needs to be diagnosed with something. Something's not right with her. I was that child. And it worked out for me in a sense because, thank God, I was put into therapy in a young age because I did evolve to do better than some people in my family. Now they hurt me because of it, but I think that's a part of some of my strength that I find in my hardships is because I did have, even when everybody turned against me and it, as a child, or I felt alone as a child, as I grew through different ages, I did, I learned that it wasn't always about me, that it was usually them and projecting their problems onto me. But so I would get put in a, an institution I put in a mental psych facility or something. And I was always called an addict or something, but I never actually was or had the issue. So what I came to find out in the domestic abuse education program and different things is like, so my abuser, for instance, when I met him and when we were dating, I had to take medicine every day, right? I took medicine every day. I took it like the doctor prescribed it, like what, the, what was written on the bottle. Okay, I took medicine every day. Well, he grew up in a family that had a bunch of addicts or different things. And so he called me from day one an addict because I had to take medicine every day. So from the beginning, he puts that into my head. I'm an addict. I'm an addict. I have a problem. I'm an addict because I actually take medicine like the doctor prescribed. And, and that was one of their things. And it's something I still fight to this day, like because of how the court system attacked. So one thing that I don't hide and that I'm very loud about, I guess you can say, is I am, I am very discouraged about what played out in the court with my case because I was attacked basically because of my medication, because of, of mental health, because I, for my life, have always been a proponent of mental health and making taking care of yourself not a stigma. And that's what I was basically attacked for in the court system instead of what I had hard good evidence of and what was legit and true that I was an abuse victim and I was a good mom and I was standing up for me and my kids and trying to get better for us. And because that doesn't just affect me, it's the ripple effect, but you not only hurt me, but you hurt other victims of abuse who are trying to get away and trying to get help. And you also hurt people who do take care of like their mental health or who want to take care of their mental health by, by doing. So you see how you not only caused one wave, but you also caused another wave because of the was decision. absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And I had, I had this exact same problem and on multiple different levels mm -hmm. at the beginning, like from the very beginning, before this magistrate even heard a lick of evidence, mm -hmm. she was requiring me to surrender my address to the man who was constantly threatening to... <laughs> and kidnap my young child. 
She put in the order, in multiple orders that she wrote, she included that our abuser was to be allowed full access to my daughter's school records. So he knows when and where she's going to be and exactly what's going on. Her medical records. How does that even make sense? And then to top it off, she had the audacity to include me in that and to tell me that if there's anything important going on with, or if there's anything with my health, I need to report it to him. And that in this most recent order, that if I attend counseling, I am to surrender whatever they need to the courts. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, are you? Oh yeah. You have to be an open book because you were, yeah. Like, oh yeah. Like my abuser side. And even like, because there's, there's multiple parties involved in my case because I was basically sent off. Like I didn't matter. And then he got custody and then another party came in and, and got custody from him. So my, my records, everything, like I'm an open book. And at this point I'm like, fuck it. I don't care. Cause I have nothing to hide. So I'm like, read what you want, read what you want look at what you can find and see. I'm like, but I'm not crazy. I don't have issues. I have PTSD and I have been an abuse victim for multiple, multiple years. And when you look at everything, all you're going to see is that I did talk to doctors about the abuse and I asked for help and I wasn't treated right. And I did ask for help and, and someone didn't do their job right. So we may have another problem on our hands. It's, it's absolutely absurd what happens. It's absolutely absurd. And it's a shame. It's such a shame because it's like, Something we brought up in the last podcast is you're stripped of your, this is America. People leave horrific things to come to this country for its freedom and its wonderfulness. And my God, wonderful women and men have died fighting for us to have these freedoms and these wonderfulness. Like I know some wonderful people who have fought and gone off to war and served for the country. And God, thank you for their, their service. But it's like, why do we do this to people? I have no rights, basically. Like I'm like, like I described last time, it's like I am in a constant, I am just laid out on the judge's table and I am, I'm just, I'm just laid out, tied down and everybody in the court system is just taking their time with me, just taking their time with me one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. And you're being you know? mocked and yeah, put yep. down and made yep. to feel like you're trash and yeah, your story doesn't time. matter and they don't yeah. believe you. Yeah, all because, all because I was like, you know what? This, this person is not changing. He's getting worse and worse and worse and worse over the years. And oh, 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 when I, when I am serious about a divorce, now he wants to, <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Like, this isn't okay. Like, this isn't okay. Stuff's going on. Stuff is happening. Like, I have to save me and my kids. I have to save me and my kids. I did the right thing. I did the right thing. And, and yeah, and it's, it's, it's really sad. I'm disgusted every single day at what happened with me and my kids. And even the other night, my, my son was asking about something. He was asking, when is it going to be us again? When is it going to be us again? Cause there were very good times when like our abuser would be off cause he would disappear. Sometimes he would get drunk and he had, he was actually the one that had an alcohol problem. And, and I'm not, this was a man with a severe alcohol problem who was very volatile and also had a drug problem and all sorts of stuff. I don't even know. I don't even know. I don't even know if I really knew everything he, he was doing. Because even when I left, I got surprised at the things that I found. Yeah, I found hidden bank accounts. I found, I mean, I knew at some point discovered there was cheating going on, all sorts of stuff. But anyways, so my son was asking me, because we would have these wonderful moments where it was just us in our house, me and my kids doing our thing, whether we were watching a movie or playing in the house or doing some artwork or this or this or this or that. But it was nice. They were my, I called us the four amigos because it was just us doing our thing. Nobody was bothering us because he was somewhere. I didn't know where he was, but I didn't really care at that point because I'm like, he can stay away. You know what I mean? As long as he wasn't at the house, we were okay. It was when he was there with us, we were in danger. And my son was like, mommy, when's it going to be that again? When's it gonna, just going to be us in the house? Because now I live in a house with one of the parties. I live with them and my kids. So I'm still under the control of somebody always. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I don't know, buddy. I'm like, I know this isn't ideal. I know you miss what we had. And I'm, I'm like, mommy really tried. I'm like, mommy tried. Mommy did everything she was supposed to do. And mommy really tried. But mommy was lied to. 
and mommy was let down and the court let mommy down and the court let y'all down. And I'm sorry, but mommy is doing everything every day that she possibly can do to get us back to where we were, where it's just us. You know what I mean? That safety factor of just us again. And, and so they ask me almost every single day, when is it just going to be us again, mommy? When is it just going to be us again? So that, sh- that should so- show somebody that like, I wasn't the unsafe factor in the situation. I was the safe factor. I was the protective parent. I was the good parent. And I was doing the right thing. I just, there was an extreme abuse of power in my situation. And I unfortunately got blamed and wrongfully blamed, wrongfully accused, and horrifically violated for trying to stand up for what was right and for protecting my children and I. And it just sucks, but it's not just me. The the survivors that I've gone on to meet in in my journey after leaving my abuser, all of us have these horrific stories of everything we experience in this court system. And it's everywhere. And it's common. It's uncommon to be treated fairly yeah. as a domestic violence victim within family courts. It's extremely uncommon. I have yet to hear about a case where a victim was treated fairly in family court. Me too. Me too. I just, I said that to my attorney not too long ago. I said that, I said, I said, I have yet to come across any survivor who has told me something positive about their family court experience and has experienced anything good. I've come across, let's see, out of now, majority of all the survivors I've come across, I've come across one male and, and the rest are females. And none of them have anything good to say about the family court system. Bes- besides what some of the stuff we brought up from the last time, all the corruption and possible trafficking, what, what in the world could be going on? But just regardless, a person, a parent having the courage to stand up and leave their house with their children, leave everything that they built And everything that they have accomplished in life to protect their children and go seek safety and protection and then to be laughed at and mocked and to be told they're crazy and just to be, oh, yeah, go back to the person trying to kill you. That's a good idea. That's, That's what you should do. It's absurd. It's absurd. There's one person, there's this attorney. I don't know what you call this person, but they're in the, they're not in the United States. It's in the United Kingdom. I love her. I watch her. I can't think of her name. Oh my goodness. She stands for domestic abuse victims. And I love her because she talks about how the United States is so horrible at condemning women who stand up against abusers and how she's like, she's like, I've never been, I have never been beaten and I take medicine for anxiety. She was like, it it blows my mind that these women come forward who have been, who have been beaten who have been psychologically and physically just harmed in all sorts of ways. And we, we just call them crazy. And then, and then we take everything from them because they have the audacity to take medicine for their problems, which is what they're supposed to do or they're recommended to do. We take everything from them and we make them feel like the lowest scum on the earth because they're actually doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah, we're not supposed to take medication to get better. We're not supposed right. to leave our abuser. We're right. not supposed to talk about it. Oh, yeah. And God forbid mm-hmm. if you call them out in public and yeah. call out your abusers because Lord have mercy. Yeah. But I love her. She When she said that, like, I can't quote her exactly. But when she said that, I was just like, please come to the United States and represent me. Like, please, please. Because that's exactly what I need because I wasn't even allowed to speak in court. Like I wasn't even allowed to speak in court. And then I don't know if I can talk about this or not, but whatever at this point, but my abusers, they manipulated a video and just played a short clip of a video. So that shows you a lot, right? Cause it's like, you got the whole movie that you missed out on, but let me just show the short clip. They really have no idea what happened that whole time. Of course it was a clip that makes me look horrible. But yeah, so that was one of the tactics my abuser used in court against me. And so he and his team of monkeys, flying monkeys, used this manipulated video, a very short, short, short video. And the judge went, she was like, how dare you? That's how she spoke to me. How dare you? And then she also said that to me when it was brought up that I left and I took my children and I to a domestic abuse shelter which is the actual place, 
like where else are we supposed to go? People right. already complain there's too many homeless people. So this is one of the resources provided by the state that's supposed to be safe. Now, some of them, they probably need to be investigated to make sure they're being ran right and there's no trafficking going on. Let's get a, a clean out going. You know what I mean? Let's get a clean yeah. out going. But shelters should be safe. Shelters should be for protection. Yeah. And again, I got to, what kind of mother takes her children to a shelter? Like, yeah. A mother I, who does I will never. Abuse. I will never forget that as long as I live. I will never forget that. It's just like the other things with PTSD, some of the images you never forget. I will never forget her face and her sitting up in that podium and looking at me like that and talking to me like that. And this is a woman judge. People get so flabbergasted when I say I had a female judge and she was a mother herself. Same. Two of them had a female magistrate and a female judge. And they both could have cared less about our situation. And I even looked into this judge prior to like having to go to court that day. Well, I had to go to court many times at this one point, but the very first time, and I had no legal representation either. That's one thing I would love to see changed prior, like for domestic abuse victims is no, just like criminals, criminals, when they go to court, they get representation, free representation, domestic abuse victims. We should have representation walking into that courtroom. We face our abusers and we have to face, and just like, I love that. I love that Netflix series. I don't know if you know it, uh, watched it made where she goes to court. uh, Well, she goes to court against her abuser and she's listening to the judge and it's like legal, 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 legal. We don't know. We don't know what's going on. And then legal documents. I didn't go to law school. Like, I don't know what's going on. And then when you have issues because the domestic abuse shelters need to clean out, I was lied to. A lot of the first set of legal advocates I had did not tell me the truth about my situation. You're walking in, you're basically the chicken going to get your head twisted off about to be cooked when you go into that courtroom. But I will never forget, I think victims should automatically get attorneys that are going to stand for them and represent them. And nothing's going to happen until they have proper legal representation. Because what they need to do is they need to structure some sort of something within the court that anything involving domestic violence is a completely, totally different entity and heard and treated and responded to appropriately with officials overseeing things who are properly trained. Trained. Yeah. And one of the issues Louisiana faces is the judges and the district attorneys, Uh, the higher level people don't have to train like everybody else does. I was just reading over that again, like in one of my brochures with the report from the Louisiana coalition is like police officers, this agency, this agency, this agency required training, required training, required training as everything changes over the years, but the higher level people, they don't have to do the required training. And that's a necessity. That's a necessity. Because they're at higher levels. They should be required to have additional training. Right. Exactly. 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 Because, I mean, I mean, it don't stop just because <laughs> you got your dream job. The world exactly. Is growing and things keep changing. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, look at us everyday people. We still learn every day. We still have to do things every day that you doing these podcasts, learning how to work your systems. We're always learning. Exactly. Just because you've got your dream job or you've got this title or you sit on this throne and you call these orders doesn't make you any less than any of us. You need to step up and do it right and 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 do do a good job cuz I mean children are dying literally. I can't tell you the amount of videos that I watch and and the amount of news that I watch. I know one survivor specifically for sure whose abuser their child after she sought help and the court system had been intervened and made a decision that there had had to have shared custody and The child was by the father. I just did a podcast with Jennifer Lynn. If you haven't Uh seen that one, I started watching her two children in the head and the police were there for six hours and refused to go into the house. And he had written letters from jail because he was arrested and charged with domestic violence 
and he was subsequently released and he was sending letters from jail saying that he was going to do this to his family. His intention was to take them all out, all yeah. five kids and Jennifer. And yeah. thankfully, three of the kids and Jennifer survived, but could have completely 100% been prevented. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Being proactive instead of reactive. That's a big switch our system needs to do. And I really think that when I read over things, like some of the things that the coalition is really trying to, some of these, some of these groups that are in support of domestic abuse and violence, like I said, you'll see some stuff with legislation and you'll see the coalition. Some things you read over and you look at, they've got like great things into place, like these programs and different things, but it's like, we got to get the people on board, the awareness and the education. If, if not all pieces are moving with it, it's not going to work right because we're still a society of reactiveness instead of proactiveness. And in a thing like this, domestic abuse and violence, we have to be more proactive. We have to be more proactive when it comes to children, when it comes to this type of thing, we have to be proactive. It's just, I don't know. It's, it's so exhausting and it's just like, it's so heartbreaking. No, it's so it's heartbreaking. It's one of those things that you look at and it's like, what the f***? Like, yeah. How yeah. has nothing been done? Yeah. All these years wow. later, all, these, wow. all this knowledge, why wow. in the hell have we not done? I mean, we've done next to nothing yeah. to fix this problem. And yeah. that's just with domestic violence. Look at yeah. air trafficking. There yeah. has literally been nothing done about that. Hell, the only groups and organizations that are out there rescuing children are veterans and people who worked for the government who quickly realized how corrupt the government is and how much involvement they have behind the scenes with trafficking, being involved in promoting it, that they get out of those official positions and they're F this. They take shit in their own hands and put together their own groups yeah. to do their own investigations and take out these bad guys because our government does nothing. That's what that's I was thinking about that on the way home and getting ready for this. Like I was thinking about something because I'm like, yeah, okay, I want to talk about this education and this awareness and, and these points. And I always get off base, but so where I live, I, I'm like, education is good, awareness is good. But the more I look at these things and I'm like, okay, this or that. And then I'm like, well, it was something I was looking at. It was information. And I'm like, this is the government website is giving this information. And then the government website is giving the, oh, I was looking at the resources because I was going to talk about some resources because the, the points like the homelessness, the substance abuse, the violent behaviors, which leads to crime, crime rates increasing and, and gang behavior, da, 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 da. Because where I live, there's apparently... There's, because I think you see it over the years, a highs and lows of it, but there's a high gang problem now and PTSD and all that. But I'm like, huh, it's interesting. The resources are usually government funded resources, like these, the victim resources and this or that. And I'm like, but you got to be careful because you got these red flags. And I'm like, you would think, I'm like, they know this. Like they give us, like we talked about last time, they give us the information. It's like right there in front of our face. Oh yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. They ha have no shame in their bull <sighs> game. None. They don't give a <laughs> They don't care. And they'll, yeah, they'll shove it right in our face. And just like with the statistics on adoptions. They, I love, by the way, I love that you got, the, I follow her. I, th I think I sent you a tell. I'm like, oh, I'm like the XTPS. Yes. Yes. Like, yes. Yes. Because I even sent that out to some people because I'm like, yes. Because I'm like, because I actually was speaking about it the next day. I'm like, when you look at the numbers, even when you look at the numbers statistically with the adoptions and the missing kids. And then the kids who go into homes of known, with records, pedophiles, abusers, the ex-incarcerated, like with these, like, but it's like really crazy shit. Um, and aside from that, how many abusers and pedophiles are held accountable? None. How many are prosecuted? How many have anything on their record at all? Barely anything. Maybe a little misdemeanor. That's what I found out here in this area of Louisiana that I lived in. That's one thing I brought up last time was that just baffled me was these, all these victims and survivors of domestic abuse and violence, basically losing everything for standing up for what is right and protecting their children. But then coming across these and, and majority of the group were males, these men who committed horrific acts against children and 
they maybe walked away with a misdemeanor and that's it. When my uncle was charged for molesting me, he was sentenced to four years. Now, mind you, that was either the second or third time he had appeared in front of a judge for child molestation. And he got four years and was out in less than two. No, that is not okay. That is not okay. And it was me and I, and there were several different people involved as, as well with that. Mm -hmm. There were three other children that I know of that Mm -hmm. he was doing that to at the exact same time. I believe it. I believe it. I know, I know of not only other survivors who have gone through it and had to deal with being around the person who molested their child, but I know I've had, I've dealt with an experience very, that hits very close to home, the molestation issue here within Southern Louisiana, where it's, it's just, again, swept under the rug, like nothing happened and they get to continue abusing little children, like nothing happens and it's not okay. And I don't know what to do about it. That's one, one of the reasons why I got into that class, that a stewardess for children, darkness into light to learn about like child abusers and child molesters and the statistics and what to look for and what we can do as a community to make it better. That's one of the certificates I have because in, in wanting to work with victims and children, that's one thing that I have a passion about as well. But I don't know, like I said, in the last podcast we did together is when you look at the dots, looking at the the survivors, the victims of abuse and children, and then these pedophiles, a heavy area with a lot of pedophilia activity, what's going on. And then these, the pedophiles getting misdemeanors are not being held accountable at all. What's the real story here? What's going on underneath it all? And nobody's going to give me the answer. Well, I mean, the only logical explanation is our government is protecting the perpetrator. I mean, there's no other explanation for it. And why? And why? Is there trafficking? Is there some sort of trafficking going on? What is it? What is it? Oh, absolutely. That's the only thing when I look at it deeply enough, like that you connect the dots on is it's got to be child trafficking, the part of the human trafficking stuff. Because that, that at this point in the United States is, is exceeding the, the drug trade. So people make more money off of trafficking children and humans, adults than anything else. When the so only option is for the government to be a part of it, because there is no way in hell mm-hmm. something would fly under the radar to this extent for this long and have next to no repercussions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. And, and it's really, it's disgusting and it's sad and it breaks my heart. I don't know what to do about it. You as an individual who either deals with it or goes through it and has gone through it, you do everything you can possibly do by what the law says. But when nothing is done about it on the other side or it's swept under the rug, like, or you're just told again, you're crazy. Nothing happened. You're crazy. Like, what else can I do? So that's why I do a lot of the things I do. Like, the classes and wanting to become an advocate and trying to work with people who do want to change the bad. Because thought, check out on YouTube and uh-huh. go to their website too, unitingamericainc.org. Okay. Kim has a, she has, there's two different TikToks. There's a Uniting America and they have a child rescue. One where they talk about specifically about different things with child trafficking. She was born into a cult wow. and there were, and, and this will show, tell you and show you just how big of a problem this is and just how big of a secret it's yeah. kept. There were yeah. over 20,000 children involved in this camp that she was in. Wow. 20,000 children that wow. were held hostage in this cult and trafficked all around the country. And people would, and people knew about it because she said that people were constantly going in and doing documentaries and doing, wanting to do, cover all these stories and nobody ever helped them. So if that doesn't spell out government corruption and government awareness, and at the very least government incompetence, then I don't know what does. Right. No, for real. Cause that's, that's crazy. Cause that's another thing when, as I'm learning that like 
the gangs, like the gang problem is a huge increase here. But that was one thing that was brought to my attention at one point was like the cults. The cult thing is an issue. Like for real, I think you could do so many different podcasts because my focus, I focus on like domestic abuse and violence and the trafficking because I think it's just such a big thing. But when you dig into it, I feel like all of those things kind of connect. They do. But you realize like the problem is very, that's what I was thinking about on the way was like, because I did not realize, I know like when I was growing up at one point, I was too young to realize what it was, but I know gangs were a huge issue at one point. And then it kind of simmered down and wasn't a problem. But apparently gangs is a big issue now where I live and around where I live. And, but also I know from like being around different survivors in the past, that was one thing that some of them did this person, like I said last time, this person said this, but did they really mean what they said? But the cult stuff. And I'm just like, oh, that's where I'm like, okay, this is so much going on right now. Like I I have a hard time ingesting it all, I guess. Yeah. I haven't dove down that rabbit hole yet. I'm kind of scared too. (laughs) Yeah. Because it's like, it's, what we deal with already in the world of abuse victims and the shunning we get for speaking out about what we deal with is enough. And then the blatant obviousness of trafficking is just enough. And, but yeah, the more awareness we can bring to so much is just, it's really out there because, and that's what it, people don't like when I, I shared this podcast with some people after, after you brought it out and they were like, wow, they were like, we had, it's good information. And they were like, it's very disturbing as well, because like people don't realize what we really go through in the family court system and what we deal with as survivors of abuse. But, Watch my podcast with Kim Kelly and Philip Drake. Yeah. Like, those I are like WTF. Yeah. I mean, he, like, and Philip worked, he worked for the federal government. He was a contractor for the federal government. And he knows for a fact, that this, all this trafficking, absolutely. I mean, he had orders from the president to ensure their little trafficking extravaganzas went smoothly and to blackmail and bribe and pay off. And this is very real. It's very oh. real. And because of the fact that it's been so well hidden, it is uh, to say it's, uh, you know, an iceberg underneath is an understatement. I mean, it's just spider web everywhere to an extreme that we've, we couldn't even possibly imagine. That's what's so scary. Like, that's what's just like, when I think about it, my stomach just gets sick. Like that, that feeling when your stomach drops, like I think about what could possibly have happened to my children and I realistically within this court system and it just makes me sick to my stomach and i'm just like how can people do that to other people and it's just it's it's mind-boggling and i feel like i've gotten like so off course because i don't know what i like we're talking about so yeah. much so sorry you may have no, to go no, it's, with this a, it's, a, it's a great show i think how i think uh, we have now will make for a badass episode i hope so i hope so okay i hope so because Yeah, because I just really wanted to talk about, I really wanted to hone in on the fact that domestic abuse and violence is a huge whole problem for all. It's not just a single problem and it affects so much. Like I have, I've struggled with different things because whether it's jobs, I've dealt with getting a job and I'm very, I'm very transparent. I believe in transparency. So I'm very much like, okay, Number one, I'm dealing with court crap because of a situation. And so I may have to come in late or I may have to leave early or I may be out for a day, but, and I'm like, but I'll make it up this or that, or da, 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 work with you. And then I have PTSD. So you may see me do some odd things because different things might trigger me, but I work well with it, but I'll jump or I'll do something or I have bad migraines. No, I deal with bad migraines with my PTSD and they'll be like, Oh yeah, we can deal with you. We can take you in. Yeah. And, and then you're let go. Something happens or they come up with something that is bizarre and somewhere probably covered. Louisiana is an at will state. And then with the legal teams, they probably have their, 
they're not going to be held accountable for firing. They never are. Yeah, right. So you're not going to be able to have a disability lawsuit, but you should, but you're not. So it, it's hard. It's it's really, really hard. And I don't think people understand like everything we go through every single day. And then the continuation of how long your cases last. And then when people like, I went a certain amount of time without my kids and I know people probably mean the nice thing by like, oh, well, aren't you with your kids now? And it's like, yeah, but they never should have been taken from me in the first place. So I appreciate that you are thinking about where I am now, but nobody can give me back those two and a half years and nobody can give me back that time and that space that I went without them. Nobody can make that up to me. Trauma. And there's, yeah. I mean, while kids are growing, there's so many things that are constantly changing. My kids were little. Like my youngest was still in his baby times. Nobody can give that back to me when they never should have been taken from me. I should have been heard properly and taken care of rightfully. And I was not. I'm at a point where people say stuff like that. Well, you have your kids now. I don't, I mean, I don't fully have them. It's half and half right now. I'm still fighting for full and I don't get, and I don't have anything. Like I had everything taken from me and I've had to, again, try to build my life, build my life, build my life. And, and then because I speak truth, like some other advocates, I've had different things, some resources cut off because I piss Susan up in GCFS off. Oh, I'm just told, waiting for my uh, retaliation. Right, right, right. Because I'm telling the truth about their trafficking. No, they cut off my, I, my I haven't started yet around <laughs> here. Like, yeah, uh, I have my podcasts and I still haven't done a story about my uh, story. Yeah. Which I have a couple things written up and yeah. online and, and whatnot, but I still have not done a video, like yeah. a full video of my story. Yeah. And when folks locally find out and realize what these idiots are doing up here yeah. at our courts, yeah, you're all an idiots up there. Yeah. I mean, with the exception of like the door folks and the, <laughs> the folks and the secretaries or, or whatnot, the powers yeah. that be that are making the decision. Yeah, you're, you're corrupt and you don't deserve your job. And I'm here to say, I will be doing everything in my power to make sure you lose your job. So <laughs> enjoy it while you can. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's definitely a Susan. I just am saying that name, but no, but I, I really wish that I, I could still be in contact with that advocate that cause the same thing happened to her. Like they cut off my food stamps cause I'm helping you. And I was like, oh, okay. But I'm like, I wish I could still see her and know her to this day. And then she got, of course, she's not with the, with the shelter anymore because I guess she spoke too much truth or knew too much. And but I, I just envisioned standing next to her, like our hands held together and our, our, our fist up, like we're standing for it. And we're not going to let it happen anymore. We're like we're not going to let the dirtiness go anymore. Like, She's coming with me. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So that's what I see whenever I'm like, talking about it or saying, no, something's got to give. Like people are not doing their jobs right. Like they're mischievously hurting us and our kids because so-and-so might be paying them under the table or making them promises or doing this or all because abusers and abuse of power. But you know, yeah. Kind of moving from the beginning, but all it takes is one person to come forward and open their mouth. And it might take time, but word's going to get around. People are going to hear. And if something like that is happening to you, you better damn sure bet it's happened to multiple well, others, other people. Yeah, multiple other people. You are not alone. And y'all, like, we have to speak out. Yeah. We cannot fix this. Society has no way of knowing what's really happening and to what extent mm -hmm. this is really at. If people aren't talking, we have to yeah. stop being afraid. Yeah. I mean, sure, they might retaliate, but regardless, it's illegal. So yeah. sue them. We have to start taking action. We do have action that we can take and we have to start following through and start holding these people accountable. We do. They need to be held accountable because it's like, it's not, cause my thing is, okay, like you, you hurt me, you hurt my kids. Don't hurt anybody else. Let's stop hurting people. Like, let's do this right. Let's do this right. We can do this better. It's a crisis. It is a national crisis, what we're dealing with, with domestic abuse and violence. And we've got to be better. We've got to be more vigilant. We've got to be more proactive and we have got to be more competent. Like, stop this, stop this. And it's just because lives that's it lives and it's 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 children's lives that's what it comes down to and it's like 
And I believe that's what I wrote at the top of this when I when I posted. I believe this is comes from when I was young. Whitney Houston had the song come out, but I believe the children are our future, and they are. They are. Let's make them our future. They they have to be. They have to be. Everything we do bad, the stuff we don't get right. Let's teach them to do it right. Give them the chance. And when we're doing this this horrible crap, we're not giving them any chances. And when we're doing this horrible crap, we're killing them. And that's not okay. And that's where I'm like, okay, this is where we draw the line. This is where this is not okay. And and this is not, we're not going to do this. We can't do this anymore. Because that's where it really gets me. Because like my kids and I were really, we were put back into an extremely dangerous situation where our lives were at risk. And that's not okay. Not okay at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so happy you had some time to join me today. Yeah. We've been trying to plan this for a hot I know, minute. And I know. Either I know. one or the other of us had to keep rescheduling. I, we hope yeah. y'all enjoy this one because it's <laughs> yeah. a hot minute to get it together. I hope, and I hope it was okay. I, I very yeah. much enjoy doing shows with you. You're more yeah. than welcome. Yeah. We should yeah. do one where we, like, we could specifically pull up, like, actual statistics and, like, actually just read through them and okay. kind of go into further discussion about those. And okay. Such. Yeah. Cause I just like write them down and everything, but then I just, I don't know how to do like the boards or anything. I know you said you can do that, right? Like or screen share. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh wait, wait, I've done a screen share like with different work stuff, so I could probably figure it out, but it has it right down on the, on the thing here. Okay, cool. Yeah. Maybe we can do that. Yeah. All right. Because what I do is I just, I just write everything down or like I take my paper and I'm just like reading it to you. Yeah, but we can we can talk oh, that. Hold on. Yeah. Since you like doing things that way, you should get one of these shindiggies if you don't have it yet. So uh-huh. Five Star has these new, I, well, I mean, I don't know if they're new. They're new to me. <laughs> they have these notebooks that have, can you see it? There's a little QR code. Oh, wow. In the corner. Oh, wow. So you can write a bunch of stuff down and take a picture of that QR code. And it will organize all of you can organize your little notes on your phone any way you want. <gasps> I'm going to have to get one of those. Yeah. It's that's, magical. What I, like, that's what that really works well for me. Cause like, especially I don't have a really good computer right now. So I work everything off yeah, my phone. It's the, it's the five. Yeah. Star. Okay. Five I have to look at that. Okay. I might have you text me if you don't mind when you're done, text me the website is, you said to look at for YouTube and then that five star notebook. Cause that would be great. That would be perfect for me. Cause I like to, I like to look at everything. I ca- I just, I copy the statistics because like, see how I do my little notes. Like see, yeah. I do my little, I, I write them all down and then I do my little arrows and then like, and I have like my, my, okay. And my little brochures like, okay, here's the problem. Yeah, that I works for you. Okay, I need to do that. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. All right. And, and I can see? share a link okay. where people can download it as well in the description. Yes. Okay. That would be awesome. Yes. Okay. So that way you don't feel like you went off, off topic too much. Way, and you can way too much. Right. right. It's I a know. We can't help it. I know. It's not like running our fat now and there's no hope for us. I'm like, I'm not going to go on. I'm going to Yes. Okay. So we will do this again. Thank you so much for your time yeah, today. Sure. I enjoy this. And I look forward, I look forward to the final put together. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll talk to you later. You are welcome. Good to see you. Have a great day. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.